Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of genre fusion, looking at songs that combine two different genres. Hopefully, the wider the difference between them, the better. Today, we're going to be looking at something that combines classical and electronic. The song is called Joga from Bjork. Let's see what she's bringing to the table today. Accidents that happen follow the dot. Her melodic phrasing is so interesting, always, <clears throat> always intrigues me. You don't have to speak, I feel emotional. Landscape, we got this panning idea in the background. The strings are gorgeous. interesting because it almost sounds like she's rushing the lines but it's just the way she phrases things it's uh, very unexpected Really nice counterpoint between that left violin and uh, the vocals. Hmm. Yeah. Putting a little bit of the panning on the violin and allowing the genres to blend a bit. interesting to hear the different ideas from the two genres bleeding into each other.
Yeah, beautiful stuff. So the first thing that I want to talk about really stands out to me is the phrasing in this song. And it's something I've picked up on um, on the last Bjork track we also checked out. Uh, she just has a really unique way of crafting a melody. When does she go for a high note? When does she hold notes? What notes should be stopped abruptly? Um, you know, looking at the length of notes and where they are placed, how a melody is phrased, she has a very unique perspective on it. And here in particular, um, one thing that constantly threw me off in the chorus was that one held out note that she hits, uh, it's the highest one and she holds it out for a couple of um, bars. Um, it, she starts that phrase on beat two, and then beat three is the hit for the held out note, the highest point of the phrase. Um, and this is in like bar three. So in the middle of the third bar is where we hit the peak rather than landing it on a downbeat and you know, uh, gaining that extra support from the rest of the uh, string section, which is emphasizing the first beat of each bar. That's where we have our chordal shifts. You know, that's also where a lot of the, uh, the runs in the strings, we have a series of quarter notes. We have the da 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 and that phrase shifts with the chord, so every... Uh, you know, whatever, we change our chord, that line moves up and down as well, but the the idea itself, four quarter notes falling probably from the root, but inverted, starting from the top and going down, rather than starting from the low root and going up. Um, it, uh, you know, we're, we're emphasizing that downbeat. We have the chordal change, we have the beginning of the phrase, we have the highest note and coming down. There's a lot of emphasis on beat one. And instead of saying, hey, I'm going to take all of that that you already have and allow it to drive home this high note, I'm going to delay it. In fact, I'm not even going to start my phrase on the downbeat of the bar. I'm going to allow my last held out note or the last sentence, I think it was, I don't remember if it was a held out note or not, to drift over into beat one of this bar and we're going to start our next phrase on beat two, but beat two is still not going to be our, our high note. It's not going to be the part that I hold out. It's not going to be the part that's emphasized that needs the extra accent behind it. I'm going to push that to beat three. And so it creates this almost Doppler effect in some cases where the strings will emphasize beat one and then she'll come in on beat two, which feels like it should be an emphasis. It's the beginning of a new phrase. And then she'll emphasize beat three with the high note um, and then hold that out until beat one where the strings come back in. And we have this bouncing back and forth of emphasized uh, beats. And it, it feels like basically almost like a bit of a round or sorry, a cannon, but instead of everybody starting one bar apart so that they can all line back up, emphasize beat one, they're starting two beats apart. So every two beats, we're getting an emphasis from a different instrument, a different voice. And it almost, like I said, almost feels like they're half a beat apart. And it's, it's very interesting because at least to me, it has a bit of a, a stuttering element to it where I feel like the whole band comes in and then she comes in. It feels like she's always two beats late on everything. Um, but what it does is draw a lot of attention to it. It's unusual and that's kind of what I get from the couple of songs I've heard from Bjork. She is uh, an experimental artist. Not pushing way outside the bounds of palatability but finding ways to work unique ideas into a palatable sound, right? I wouldn't say anything about this was experimental or avant-garde, 
Um, it definitely combined two styles of music, but I think they complement each other very well. I don't think either one of them detracts from the other. Uh, there's a lot of consonant harmony existing in it. Melodic lines are still four beat phrases. Or sorry, four bar phrases. We're still working in four four. There's nothing in here that I find that would that I think would be too abrasive for a mainstream audience. But she finds ways to still push it outside of the bounds of what is traditionally mainstream pop music or uh, whatever you want to call this classical pop. Uh, I don't know. To me, it's pop music. It just doesn't use pop instrumentation. Um, and that's that's one of the things that I'm coming around to really enjoy about her works. Granted, I've only heard like two or three songs from her now. Um, Army of Me and this one. Maybe only two. Um, but yeah, she she finds... She finds ways to push the boundaries within the realm of palatability while still being close to that singer-songwriter pop realm. Um, and I know she's played around with other things too. You know, I saw a collaboration she did with uh, some, I don't know, it was a pop punk band or like a metalcore band or something like that, an Army of Me cover where it was like uh, rock-based. That worked very well, <laughs> honestly. Um and, and yes, yeah, it's just like the whole thing about her pushing boundaries is what draws me to her work, to her art. Um, and, you know, I, I've, been, I've been mostly talking about phrasing here, but there's also some interesting syllabic inflection going on in here that kind of throws me off. She'll, she seems to have an understanding of the music, even though it's the lyrics, the words themselves, but divorced from the words. Um, it, it, there, there's some words that she says that she puts the emphasis on a syllable that we typically don't emphasize in everyday speech. She doesn't allow natural linguistic elements to interfere with her musical interpretation and, and performance. And again, it's something that kind of draws attention to itself. It makes it feel a bit odd. Um... But it's odd against perceived biases. Her phrasing feels odd because we're used to everything lining up on one. Her uh, her syllable inflection feels odd because we're used to hearing words a specific way. And uh, I think she just does a real good job of, of pushing the bounds on that. Where it's she's kind of making, at least me sometimes, feel uncomfortable listening to her music. But in a way that I want to continue listening which is very different from pure avant-garde or experimental or free jazz or anything like that, where it's abrasive to the point where sometimes it's going to turn people away. Um, and like I said a couple of times now, I just I really appreciate that direction that she takes, where it's experimental but still very listenable. Now going from there, we have... I'm going to look at the intro real quick, and then we're going to move into how the song evolved. It's a pretty simple track overall. We have the vocals. Well, actually, we start off with uh, the string section, and they just provide this really nice sound floor, right? We have a nice moving chord progression throughout there. Eventually, she brings her vocals into the mix and provides a melody on top of this beautiful chord progression that we uh, started the song with. And past that, we begin to hear more and more elements creep in. To begin with, I think the next one was that panning electronic sound. Uh, it was very low, almost like a rumble, I'd say. And I think this was the foreshadowing to what would come next. Coming into the song, I knew we were going to have electronic elements just because that's how it was introduced to me. But, you know, I assume that somebody who might be listening to this album for the first time and isn't aware of that, it's a really nice way of foreshadowing what's to come. I don't know if the whole album has this genre fusion to it. It's very possible that people would be expecting it anyways. But, you know, at least I think if you were to listen to this in isolation and have no idea, it acts as a really nice way of showcasing, hey, you know, get prepared. 
right? We got something coming. First of all, it is just a low rumble. It is full of tension. It is full of potential energy. It hasn't pushed forward into what it might become, but it also just acts as a, like I said, a foreshadowing, showcasing something we're going to get into, but not putting a spotlight on it yet. It's kind of sneaking it in there. And then we have the left panned violin, I think is what comes in next. And this provides a little bit of counterpoint to what's going on with the vocals. It is a moving melody line. I think it is a lick or a riff or an ostinato or, you know, just a repeated phrase, right? And so it's, it's, not, it's not a linear melody that can really contrast heavily with what Bjork is singing, but it does provide a moving element that works against and sometimes with Bjork's melody as well. And I think it just works very well at supporting specific ideas and allowing dyads to be created that add on top of the chords that we're already hearing. And just everything about this section oozes beauty. That's a weird verb for that. <laughs> it, it, it's a beautiful section. And it's not just any one thing. You know, I think Bjork has a, a wonderful voice. She really knows how to command uh, attention uh, and craft phrases and, and just have really strong melodic components and has the chops to support them in the way that she wants them to sing. She has a lot of wild jumps in pitch. She's not somebody who, who inches up into high notes and then pulls back down she just kind of jumps around in pitch in whatever she thinks feels right for the moment and it definitely takes singing chops to do that not just the muscle memory of being able to almost coldly hit a pitch but also to make those jumps repeatedly um it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and it, it definitely can put a bit of stress on the vocal cords, and she just makes it sound so effortless. So we have this beautiful singing. We have this beautiful counterpoint line. Uh, we have this gorgeous uh, chord, chordal structure underneath all of it, and we have these little ideas of electronic music creeping in. And honestly, it works. It really does. We get more of a, I think we get more of a, a electronic sound coming in on the right side uh, before we go into the full uh, techno breakdown, so to speak. I don't think, it's not really like a good drop, but it is sort of breakdown-y, especially compared to what came before it. Um, but we do get more of a, a very full sound. It's a very wide soundscape. We have we have instrumentation all throughout. Uh, and just it all comes together into this really evocative, beautiful musical element. And we go from that into something that's a bit more gritty. It's not a full on drop. I'm actually kind of curious when this came out. 1991. Okay, so that definitely changes things. I don't know what the techno scene was like in 91. This to me feels very tame, but I'm coming at it from 2010's post dubstep techno where, the, you know, every song has a drop and we have, you know, wildly different production styles, I would say, especially compared to how electronic is represented here. Um, but, you know, modern techno is just very bass heavy, very punchy. And this is not, but it also falls in line very well with the classical music, which isn't going for much of a punch either. So I don't, like I said, I don't know much about 90s techno music. I don't want to say that this is indicative of it, but compared to the techno I have heard, I do hear a drastic difference here in how the techno is produced. Um, so we go into the section though, and it is, it's a bit gritty. Right there's a bit of, of fuzz and distortion on the the lower end bass section, um, and it kind of feels like I said it kind of feels like it wants to be a breakdown, not like a metal breakdown, not like a, a modern techno drop, but utilizing that same sort of composition technique of finding a way to break through the strong melodic writing and 
reduce the song down to something that's a bit more bassy and rhythmic and uh, felt rather than heard. Uh, you know, it kind of moves towards more of a textural element than a melodic one. I think it's an interesting interlude, but it's kind of just that, which again may be the purpose of it. The point of a breakdown is to sort of reach the opposite of what we've heard, to provide strong contrast. Um, I mean, I don't think you get more contrasty than the stereotypical drop, which reduces our volume to basically zero before bringing it back in, back up to 10. You know, we come back in real hard. Even metal breakdowns, especially when we look at stuff like deathcore, the breakdowns are designed to provide a harsh contrast by hitting the lowest notes we have, the lowest growls, the lowest strings, um, you know, really dropping everything down and utilizing a lot of space and weight uh, to contrast some of the faster elements in the rest of the track. And I think this does that same thing well. It provides a moment for the song to remove all of the high end because the song is very filled with a lot of high end stuff and focus more on the low end element, focus more on the texture of it and to provide a moment to sort of think about what you listen to and kind of take in the beauty of what you just saw and have a moment to get prepared for it to come back. This is pretty much storytelling 101. There's a reason that when you read a book or watch a film, it does not constantly escalate. That it'll have an escalation, it'll reach a high point, and it'll dip down a little bit. And it'll bring bring everything back down for a moment, and then go for another escalation, and hit a new high point, and then bring it back down a little bit. And it's because most people need that moment to breathe. It is uh, considered the baseline good story writing to have moments to reflect on what has happened. And uh, I, I kind of feel like that's what's going on here. It's an interesting section that provides contrast to what we heard. It showcases uh, the electronic side, which we already did get to hear a showcase of the acoustic side at the beginning of the track before we began to introduce the electronics um, sounds. And it also provides the listener a moment to reflect on what we have heard before and give them a moment to catch their breath before we move into the next part. Um, interestingly, no, we'll get into that in a second. We'll get into that in a second. Um, and then the song comes back in though and I feel like uh, there's a strong mix of everything. And this mix isn't something I've really talked about yet. I've talked about how the acoustic instruments do the acoustic things, the electronic instruments do the electronic things. All right, acoustic instruments are set in place, they have their own timbre, they play melodies and harmonies and chords, and the electronic sections provide texture and they can do panning and they do all the electronic things. But the cool thing about this track is that, unlike some of the stuff we've listened to this week where it's sort of separated, you have genre one, you have genre two, they might overlap a little bit, but it's not usually passing ideas along between them. You'll have your instruments that are designated to the genre. And here, we heard some uh, electronic sec or electronic instruments kind of taking what the violins were doing at the beginning and passing that idea to them. So now they're a static instrument playing a melody or contributing to the chord and then you know going into that breakdown section we had a violin get super stretched out uh, and then panned left and right like it just wasn't allowed for its sound to naturally decay for it to you know diminish it, it got uh, artificially stretched and then pan back and forth they applied electronic elements to it and in the final moment of the song we took a line that the vocalist sung, pushed it pan right, duplicating her voice because she sings at the same time it does, which is the only time this happens, duplicates it into an electronic element of it, pans it to the side, and puts it on loop, applying electronic elements to the acoustic. It is very cool to see 
this cross skill, cross genre use of composition happen in this song. This isn't just about putting classical sounds with techno sounds. It is about allowing the two to crossbreed and create new sounds that can't be done in either or. Although I suppose that uh, that kind of really only goes one way. That's not to say that electronic music can't play chords or harmonies or melodies um, and that they have to be moving around and using electronic stuff. I guess it really only goes one way where we kind of digitize some of the acoustic stuff. But when we look at the way that they are used in the song, especially in the first third of the track, they are designated to specific roles. And we get to see throughout the song those roles get flipped. And I think that's a really interesting way to go about merging a genre or merging two genres together. Um, I think the point, well, no, because I mean that diminishes things. One of the things I love about the possibilities of genre fusion isn't just hearing two sounds together that typically don't, but it's about finding new sounds that didn't exist before. And I really like the approach here. I'm really curious what the musical landscape looked like in 91, um, especially what techno might have looked like in that era. I mean, I was only three years old. I definitely wasn't listening to music <laughs> critically at all, much less specifically electronic music. Um, and even when I got to an age when I was finally finding my own way into music. Well, first of all, we were in the 2000s by then. So a little late to, to hear what early 90s uh, techno was doing. But uh, I wasn't getting into techno at all anyways. And uh, yeah, like I said, I, I'm really curious how this represents or works in favor of or even against. Uh, actually, that's a good idea because... Yeah, hit me up with that, about how this represent, representation of techno or how the techno elements were used here versus how they were used in the techno scene at the time, or the electronica scene, whatever you want to call it. Um, because, you know, I've already talked about how she kind of pushes the boundaries in how she phrases melodic, uh, uh, how she phrases her vocal lines, right? Which says that, you know, she kind of goes against the grain with things musically. We've talked about in Army of Me that she kind of goes against the grain um, with the music that surrounds her melody lines because, uh, you know, she was using odd chords and uh, just really going for more of an, an odd phrasing even in the music, but also the chords were interesting. I don't remember what, uh, it was, that whole song was using an interesting mode that doesn't get utilized very often. And uh, I had some people in the comments tell me, and I was I can't remember what that was. Was that Locrian? I think that song was in Locrian. Either way, though, is a is a rarely, rarely used chordal mode that uh, was presented very heavily in that track. So she pushes the boundaries in pop, uh, vocally, musically. And I'm wondering if she was pushing the boundaries electronically as well here, if, if this was more in line with electronic music uh, of the time, or if maybe she was doing new things and uh, being genre pushing there as well. I guess we're going to dive into some lyrics here and see what's up. I really didn't catch much that was going on, mostly because, like I said, her phrasing and syllabic inflection kind of... Uh, made it difficult for me to understand some of the words. So, uh, all these accidents that happen follow the dot. Coincidence makes sense only with you. You don't have to speak, I feel. Okay, so it's not just, uh, it's not just that she chooses odd syllables to emphasize. She also has a very interesting way about crafting the feeling of the words. This is a very difficult a uh, series of sentences to make sense of. There's definitely an over underlying connection between them all. Um, you know, it's all about finding the patterns. Coincidences make sense, follow the dot, the accidents happen. Uh, you know, there's a series of events that have happened in a specific way. You just need to see the pattern into it. Only with you, you don't have to speak, I feel. All right. 
Um, emotional landscapes, they puzzle me. The riddle gets solved and you push me up to the state of emergency. How beautiful to be. The state of emergency is where I want to be. So it seems that uh, she's saying... Well, at least the narrator of the song. I don't want to put this directly on her as a vocalist. I don't know if she's injecting herself into these lyrics or not. But at least the narrator here it has a difficult time handling emotions or maybe, um, you know, being in a, a relationship with someone and being able to read emotions or like the societally accepted ways to deal with emotions. And she kind of just wraps all this up into saying that emotional landscapes puzzle her. She says she tries to riddle, oh, the riddle gets solved and you push me into a state of emergency that's beautiful and it's where I want to be. I don't understand that at all. What does it mean to be a state of emergency? I mean, unless it's just like the pure chaos inside. You figure out what you're supposed to do emotionally in a situation and yeah, and then you push me into a state of emergency. I don't... Although you can't solve, okay, so, oh man, either I'm getting way too deep into this or there is a lot of layers here and I'm really impressed. So you can't solve emotions. That's kind of the deal there. She likens emotional landscapes to a puzzle, but emotion is sort of the opposite of logic. And yes, I know there's a lot of things that go against that. Right? There's a lot of science that says you need your emotions to rationally solve problems. But I think generally people under or people have an understanding that rational thoughts, puzzle solving, problem solving is different from emotional solving, which is more of a gut feeling or you know thinking with your heart, that kind of vibe. It's not thinking with your brain, right? And again, generalizations, stereotypes, we're not talking about hard science here. We're talking about the way people perceive things. Emotions aren't something you typically solve your way through. So it could be that she's applying logic to emotional situations and it's not lining up properly. This other person um, doesn't really get where she might be coming from as she logics her way through an emotional situation. Maybe it upsets them. Maybe she seems cold and calculating because of it. All right. So it says, then you push me into a state of emergency, right? There's a situation that happens because of it. You know, I can't believe that you're feel that you're so cold and calculating here. I'm telling you that this is, you know, frustrating me or I'm sad or I'm, I'm angry or whatever, you know, bringing these emotions into it. And you're just speaking about it logically, like it's some sort of puzzle. And then maybe she gets a little stressed out because she thought she had it solved and she doesn't. And now she's panicking a little bit because she has a difficult time reading emotions. And now she's in a state of emergency, but there's a heightened element to it because she doesn't feel that calculating element. She feels something. She has an emotional change in it because of it. I don't know. That's kind of where I'm getting with that. And and maybe she just really enjoys being in that state because it's different. It is feeling and she just maybe isn't used to that. Um, at least maybe feeling, getting those feelings with uh, another person. Even though this isn't a super healthy way to go about having these feelings of elation, um, you know, it could be that that's what's going on here. It's the only way I can read this. <laughs> I don't know why somebody would want to be in a state of emergency, but it, the song's very cryptic. We get into verse two. It says, all that no one sees, you see what's inside of me. Every nerve that hurts, you heal deep inside of me. You don't have to speak, but I feel. And then we go back to the emotional landscape thing. So yeah, this other person just really understands her. And I think she has a problem understanding them or maybe reciprocating that uh, that intimacy, and it could be something to do with, like I said, not being able to read people or emotions, uh, and maybe coming off as a bit too cold and calculated as she tries to riddle her way through emotional situations. Um, and that ends up 
hurting the other person, which brings it back to her, and she doesn't want to hurt them, so now she's in a state of panic, but it's a state of feeling something other than not understanding, which is great. And we just kind of go back and forth between all of this. That's that's the whole song. Um, I I don't know. <laughs> that's honestly all I got here. Um, and so, how do I relate that back to? Well, I mean, how do I relate that back to anything? I don't think my entire understanding of this song comes from the chorus. Well, verse 2, I think, as well. But verse 1, I mean, it's all about the fact that accidents don't happen and everything has a pattern. Kind of don't know if I can tie it back to that. And then musically, I mean, you can I guess you can kind of see it as uh, oil and water kind of trying to meet in the middle and find a common point. But I really don't think that classical and electronic are really that divorced from each other to be seen in this light of somebody who is very familiar and intimate with uh, someone else. But that intimacy and understanding can't be reciprocated due to an emotional hurdle. Uh, there, there's just a huge divide between those two people. There's a, a massive gap in uh, em emotional weight and emotional work that can be put in for the two. Uh, and it creates a clash that, again, I don't feel in the music. So either the music doesn't have much to do with the song, or I have a very wrong, <laughs> way off the mark read on what these lyrics are about. I suppose that's possible. But as usual, Bjork is just a mystery. I, when we checked out Army of Me, I, had, I, I felt like I had some insight. But I walked away thinking that I, I had more questions after listening to it and after analyzing it uh, than I did at the start. So... I guess this is where you guys come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you thought of Bjork's yoga. Uh, if this, if you have anything to help me understand what's going on, if you think I'm right, if you think I'm wrong, if you have anything to correct or add on to what I've said, please go ahead and do that. Above the comment section, if you could, there's a description box and there's a link for Linktree. It'll take you to this menu right here. You can pick up some merch, join me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter, join the Discord, a bunch of stuff. Go ahead and check it out above that. If you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, we have a special selection coming out today. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC, as usual. We'll be checking out more genre fusion and another special selection. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.